so so we can get started. So welcome everybody. Good to see you back. Uh, we are moving along in the book of Joshua, and today we have gotten to we are in chapter 15, and we are really going to zip through 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 today. How's that? Well, clearly, we're not going to read all those chapters. They are chapters that are largely setting forth boundaries. And since I am not a cartographer and I am not much into geography, um, so we're not going to actually go read them all through. If those of you are interested, there are many of many of these maps available that show the biblical territories. And I would recommend, you know, getting one and studying all the different places. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, but I do want to point out there's all kinds of scriptures here that are interesting and that show different different insights. So we're going to do it that way. Okay, so we start with the beginning of verse um, of, of chapter or, uh, 15, verse 1, and it starts talking about the lottery or the hagoral. You know what? Let me see what my English translation translates that. Uh, okay, where am I? Because I, I always go back and forth. I have my Hebrew Bible, which is what I feel most comfortable with, but then when I want to see how something is translated. Okay, so they translated goral as lot, you know, lot as in throwing lots or in, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I just want to make a comment about that. It is clear here, and it will be, it is clear by assumption, and later on we'll see that it's actually set forth scripturally very specifically that on the one hand it is something that seems to be done by chance um if you picture it uh there's going to be um let's say different borders or different cities or different areas thrown into a pot and someone picks up you know picks up like a, the, the 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 note and you say oh look what i got okay and yet it's very very clear that these lots are being defined by God, that there is something prophetic about the way this is being done. But I find it very ironic that the system used is this lot system that makes it look and seem like a coincidence, like something just by chance, when really it is the last thing possible. And as I said, we'll see later on how that actually works. Uh, let's go continuing in this chapter, chapter 15, verse 12. Here we get um, here we get a specific thing about something we just studied last week. Uh, and Caleb, Caleb, the son of Yefune, uh, and he was given a proportion within the, the sons of Judah. And look at what it says here, according to the word of God to Joshua. Okay, so already here we have a, uh, an indication that it's not a coincidence. Okay, that here specifically says that Caleb is receiving... Kiryat Arba, um, who is Arba? We learn here the father of the giant or the head giant, uh, in, uh, which is also called Hebron. And here we have um, that Caleb inherited this, or he um, took it over from the three giants, Sheshai, Achiman, and Talmai, the um, children of the giant. So Anak means giant, okay? Um, but it could also be the name of somebody. It could be that Arba was the follower, the father of Anak, and Anak had three children, Sheshai, Achiman, and Talmai. <coughs> Whatever it is, it's clear that we're talking about these superhuman people in terms of their size. And here we have, you know, we have one remnant of the giants. This is the last remnant we're going to see here. There will be one additional remnant of the giants that we'll meet later on, of course, when David comes up against Goliath. But we know there is this concept of giants that were in the land at that time, and they end up disappearing. Anyway, in verse 15, and he went from there to the people of to the people settled in Dvir. And Dvir was originally called Kiryat Sefer. Kiryat Sefer is very interesting. Kiryat Sefer means the city of the book. Okay. I don't know why. What, what kind of books they were reading there, but that's very interesting. It also has a different name. And so Caleb here puts forth an announcement, okay? Get ready, women. This is great for the, I love this story. Okay, Caleb says, whoever will capture Kiryat Sefer, I will give him 
My wife, Achsa, as a wife. My daughter, Achsa, is a wife. Who ends up capturing it? Othniel, the son of Kenaz, who is Caleb's nephew. So basically, Caleb is married. Uh, Othniel ben Kenaz marries his first cousin, who is Achsa, the daughter of, of uh, Caleb. Okay, so that's all in the family. But it's clearly, it becomes something that he's offering to someone who's going to do something to merit his wife. And he's using this as a, um, as a sort of uh, a tease, you know, as, as, a, as a, a motivation. You know, you'll get a reward. You'll get this wonderful wife. Uh, and, you know, we don't know very much until this point about Achsa. We assume she was a beautiful woman. But we learn in the next verse that she's far more than beautiful. She's brilliant. Okay. So she comes into the picture. And what does she do? She goes to her father and she makes a complaint. Now, what has happened so far? We have this place called Vir, or it's called Kiryat Sefer. And it's right near Hebron. And Caleb, it's part of his general territory. But he says, I'll give this city to, or this place to whoever captures you know, I'll give the wife to whoever captures it. Othniel captures it, okay? But then she comes, and here she is. She marries this guy, and he's just received this piece of land. And she notices that it's it's not very good land because there's a problem. There's no water there, okay? So she goes to her, fa- to her father. She, she goes to him on this donkey. She comes off the donkey, like, you know, and he says, oh, my dear daughter, you know, what can I do for you? And she says, well, give me a blessing, okay? And she says, you know, you gave us a very dry land. And Negev, it says, Eretz HaNegev, land of the Negev. Negev usually means south, but Negev is also known as a territory of Israel that is desert. And so it's not just that you gave me the southern territory, but you gave me this desert area. (coughs) Now, those of you who've been in Israel, and even if you haven't, you know uh, based upon uh, this area, uh, start with Abraham, for example. Abraham starts up north in Shechem. He travels down. This is, by the way, following Route 60, today's Route 60, uh, going down from Shechem, due south, uh, passing through Jerusalem, keep going south, going to through what is today called Gush Etzion, continuing south, you hit Hebron. Okay, once you hit Hebron, this road 60 continues south and then veers to the west and ends up connecting with Beersheba. Now, this is Abraham's route. He went, for if you remember, after he was in Hebron, he would go back and forth between Hebron and Beersheba. And if you recall, when Sarah dies, Sarah is in Hebron, but Abraham is in Beersheba, has to go back to Hebron to bury her. Okay, and, and so he's back and forth. That area between Hebron and Beersheba is actually the area where the Judean mountains go from green to brown. If any of you have been with me as we drive from Hebron to some of the communities south of there, if we go to Susia or to Beit Yatir or to Otniel or to any of those places, you can see as you're driving how the landscape becomes more and more barren, which right there is where uh, that's where Kirat Sefer, this is where Devir is, and this is given to Achsa, but she doesn't have water. So he says, okay, I'm going to give you two sources of water, and there's something called an upper well or upper source and a lower source. They are not exactly, we're not exactly sure where they are, but they're clearly nearby Devir, and so he adds to this gift of Devir, he adds to her as well, uh, this water source. And I just... I just think this is such a great story because you see this woman, Othniel's a warrior. He, he likes this idea of the prize. He clearly wants Achsa. He goes and captures the area, but he has no clue about what you do after you capture it. And here's this woman who comes along and understands that to settle an area, and we talked last week about the difference between capturing an area and settling an area, she understood that in order to settle an area, you're gonna to have to have a source of water. And so she immediately figures that out and goes and asks Caleb for that as well. So that is that section. Okay, skipping along, uh, we are going to be still in the same chapter, but I wanna point out verses 55 and onward. There's a number of cities there. Again, here, where we are here in 55, uh, verse 55 uh, until the end of the, close to the end of the of the chapter, we're in the same neighborhood, okay? We're going back to that same Hebron Hills area 
which is the area between Hebron and Beersheba. So if you see in verse 55, there's a number of, of towns here. One is called Ma'on and one is called Carmel. Now those two towns uh, figure ver in, in King David's story, which is decades, hundreds of years later, actually. Um, King David, it's probably about 400 years later, King David, if you recall, is running away from Saul and ends up in the Judean desert. He ends up here, okay? And who does he come upon? He comes upon this na nasty fellow named Nabal, okay? Nabal is the Carmelite because he's from Carmel right here. And the verse there in the beginning of the, of the story, and I mean, I, I, I forgot to find it, but it's in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, there, the story goes, uh, that there's this fellow Nabal who is from Ma'on, but his business interests are in Carmel. So you know they're neighboring cities and they're mentioned here. So it's not just cities from the time of David. These cities exist in the time of Joshua as well. And then there's another city right at the end of that, which you know is in the very same area called Utah. Okay, this is not Utah as in um, Las, isn't Las Vegas. No, that's in Nevada. What's in Utah? whatever, Salt Lake City, right? No, it's not that Utah. There's a Utah right here. And in fact, just south of Hebron, there is a huge Arab city called Yatta. And it's fairly clear that Yatta preserves this biblical name Utah. And that's where it was. Okay, so if you visit today, the communities in this area, such as Beit, Beit Haggai and Otniel, you look north, uh, east, you will see this Arab city called Yatta. And that's here. Now, I just mentioned the community of Otniel, uh, which is on the original biblical road that leads Hebron to, that links Hebron to Beersheba. There's this community called Otniel. Why is it called Otniel? Because this is thought to be in the area of Dvir or Kiryat Sefer, which was given to Otniel, which we just read before. Okay, so it kind of all comes together. I know this area very well because this is modern Israel and we drive along here. And for me, it's very special when I read these names to know that these names are preserved even today. Now in verse 58, the first town there is called Chalchul, and that's the exact name of another Arab city just north of Hebron, Chalchul. Okay, now we know that the Arabs, one of the things that has helped us when we came back to the land to figure out where are these places, many of the places that when the Arabs gave the names to places, they essentially preserve the original Hebrew or biblical names of these places. So it's clear if you have an Arab city called Chachol, just north of Hebron, and everything you mentioned here is in that same area, it's going to be the same place. Okay, now in verse 60, there's another place called Kiryat Baal, he Kiryat Yarim, now, which is Kiryat Yarim. And you have another example of two different cities, uh, two names for the same city, Kiryat Baal and Kiryat Yarim. Um, this actually is, at the, we're going back, until now we were in the southern parts of Judea, and now we're going to the very the northern parts of Judea, and in fact, this is an area that is today just west of Jerusalem, and it's on the border between Judah and Benjamin, and um, I think it's very interesting, these two different names, because Kiryat Yarin, that means the city of forests, okay, and it seems it was called that because there was a lot of forest area there, and even today, when we come up the main road to Jerusalem, uh, right there up on the left, as you coming up to Jerusalem from Tel Aviv, you will see a sign that says Kiryat Yarim. Uh, it is considered, uh, there's another name for it today called Kiryat Tel Stone, but that's just because it's named for somebody. But um, uh, right near Kiryat Yarim is Abu Ghosh. Uh, and actually, uh, they think the biblical Kiryat Yarim is Abu Ghosh. Is, is right where Abu Ghosh is today. And what I find interesting is that we have this alternative name, Kiryat Baal. Now Baal is the name of an idol, okay? The Baal is an idol, but it's an idol that doesn't show up this early. It's, a, it's an idol that shows up much later, okay? And so it could very well be that at this time, the Baal didn't reference it. Baal literally means master. And there's a theory that says that the word Baal originally meant master or God of any kind. In other words, you could have used the name Baal and even referred to God as a way of saying master, you know, just an alternative name to reference your respect, your deference for God as your master. Later on, it became 
an idol, a pagan reference, because these different gods were called Baal. And so you later on, you do not see this word Baal uh, used ever, ever in a positive way. And, and just to um, kind of point something out that I don't know if you've ever noticed, but there are some people who in the book of Samuel or in the book of Judges have the name Baal, but, um, or no, in Chronicles, they have the name Baal, but in the book of Samuel or the book of Judges that do not have that name. Uh, so for example, another name for Gideon, uh, who's in the book of Judges is Yeru Baal. He's referred to as Yeru Baal in Chronicles. And um, there's um, uh, an, one of the sons of Saul, his name is Ishbosheth, uh, and he's, he's in Chronicles, he's called Ishbaal. And the theory being that they used that name initially because it was positive, but very, by the time they got around to writing down the book of Judges and the book of, of um, Samuel, uh, it, the Baal was a, was a pagan word. And so they, they changed the names. But by the time it, the book of Chronicles is written in the second temple period, much later when Baal doesn't exist for centuries already and no longer becomes a threat and therefore they go back to the original name. So I just think that's that's one example how this name Baal can have had a, a, a fine positive connotation and of course takes on a negative connotation later on. Okay, onward. Verse 63, we learn about Jerusalem. And we learn here, this is a very significant fact that the Jebusites were sitting in Jerusalem and Judah did not succeed in conquering that city. So you have here that the Jebusites are like a Jebusite enclave in the middle of Judah, the city of Jerusalem. Now, if you picture Jerusalem up on this hill uh, and particularly the old city of Jerusalem, it's way up on a hill. It's a fortified city. And we know at the time of the Jebusites, it's also a fortified city because we remember the story in the book of Samuel of of David conquering the city from the Jebusites. And even then they talk about it being a walled city. So it's up on this hill surrounded by a wall. And so you can understand how this is going to be much harder to conquer than just the rest of the countryside. And so they leave it there for a while. Um, and uh, certainly where it says to this very day, to this very day, of course, is as of the time of the, the book of Joshua is written, but it's not to today because later on we learn the book of Samuel that David actually conquers uh, this area. Okay, now let's move into chapter 16. And here I have a personal connection to some of these borders because this is where I live. So for those of you who have been with me in Carnation Rome, if you look at verse 16, chapter eight, uh, verse eight, excuse me, chapter 16, verse eight, you'll talk, we're talking here about the borders of the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the sons of Joseph. And so we have here from Tapuach, the border goes to the west along the Kana Brook, and it goes out westward. Its tributaries or the, or the, the path of the brook uh, goes westward. This is the territory of the tribe of the children of Ephraim to their families. Now, turns out that if you hear, and then if you look later on in uh, chapter 17, verse 8, we have here a similar kind of description when we're talking about the border of Manasseh. Manasseh had the land of Tapuach. The Tapuach is the border of Manasseh between the border of Manasseh and the children of Ephraim. And again, we have the border going um, along the Kana Riverbank, southward, excuse me. Those, um, those cities to the south belong to Ephraim and those to the north belong to Manasseh. Okay, so what I, where I live, okay, I live in Cardinal Rome. We are literally on the Kana River Valley or the Kana Brook. That's where our community is. We are just to the north of that. And so we are in the biblical territory of Manasseh. If you look across the valley and you see there another, other communities, other hills, you are looking at the tribe of Ephraim. So I really, really understand this border because I'm living on it. OK, and it's really neat. It is kind of a natural geographic border, which is nice. And um, Anachal, by the way, um, let me see how it's translated in the English. Um, where is it? Here we go. 16 verse 8. One second. I'm just curious how they translate the word Anachal. Okay. Um, 
Hmm. Where am I? 16 verse 8. Here we go. Um, oh, it says wadi. Wadi is the Arabic word for anacha. And what it means is it's like a riverbed. It's a place where a river can come to life if there's bad rains. Suddenly, water streams in that area. Otherwise, it's more like a valley. So where I am, it's like a valley almost all the time. Uh, every so often, it, it has a lot of rains. But today, we also have different kind of drainage systems. So the point is to try to use this water um, and not let it just run into the rivers. But that's, that's a, a different issue. Okay, so... Let's go now to chapter 17, verse 3. And here we meet women that we had met before. Uh, you may remember uh, in the book of Numbers, uh, where, where, by the way, we have a division of territories by Moses, okay? What happens here is a more practical uh, uh, division of the territory. Some of it, though, has already been set forth by Moses. We have there a situation where there's a man named Salafachad, or Salafachad, I think is how you say it in English. Um, and uh, he died. He died already in the desert. Uh, and he doesn't have he doesn't have any sons. He only has daughters. He has five daughters. And here we have the names, Machla, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza. And, um, and so this tells, this, this reminds us there was a story where Moses said, based upon God's word, to him that in this case when a original head of a you know family doesn't have sons then it's the daughters who will inherit and here these women then come before Elazar the high priest and Joshua and basically saying now's the time for you to actually give us the territory that Moses had promised to us and if you take a look at what they get okay they are getting look at verse 6 they are getting these daughters of Manasseh, got their territory within the sons, okay? And the land of the Gilead was for the other sons of Manasseh. Where's the land of Gilead? That's on the eastern part of the Jordan. If you remember, Manasseh was a tribe that was split. Half the tribe ended up getting their territory with Reuben and God to the east of the Jordan. And the rest of them got their territory to the west of the Jordan. So these women all got their territory to the west of the Jordan, okay? And in fact, not far from where I live, in the area of Shechem, okay, there are a number of places that have names of some of these daughters. For example, Tirza. There is a, a, a Nachal, again, a, a Vadi or a Nachal, one of these valleys, that's called the Tirza Valley. And for those of you who have been with me to the Three Seas Outlook, um, you see in front of you, to the north of you, you can see the Oak of Mora. On the other side of the Oak of Mora, there's like a hill in between. On the other side, there's the Tirza Valley. The Tirza Valley leads from the Jordan River in the, in the east all the way up to Shechem. Okay? And it's thought that this is how, when Abraham came into the land, he would have crossed the Jordan up round by the Tirza Valley, maybe slightly north of there. Okay, and then come across the Tirza Valley, which is why his first stop is going to be at the Oak of Mora near Shechem, because that's where the Tirza Valley brings you. Okay, so that's very interesting. Now it's clear that that valley didn't have that name in Abraham's time, but it has that name today. There's also a city called Tirza, which is where the original capital of Samaria, after the northern kingdom splits from the southern kingdom of Judea, the first capital is in Tirza. Well, it's in Shechem for a while, then it's in Tirza before it moves to Samaria, which is today called Sebastia. Uh, anyway, again, after that name. And very interesting, archaeologists have found in the area of Shechem all kinds of ruins dating back to the time of Ahab and before. And one of the things they find, they found a lot of uh, clay pieces you know, that have inscriptions on them in the same way that today we take a piece of paper and, or a stick it or something, you know, and we make notes and scribbles and whatever. They used to do that on clay pieces of paper. So they see all kinds of things referring to areas in that area around Shechem that have these names, Machla, Noah, Chogla, Milka, and Tirza. So each of these five women, this is where their territory was in the area surrounding Shechem, in the area of Manasseh surrounding Shechem. And, and so we have evidence of that 
even to today. Okay, next, I want to jump ahead to verse 14. And um, here, this is, this is very, uh, very neat. Um, okay, so we up until now, we have the, the uh, territories set forth. Everybody knows where they're supposed to go. They're supposed to go out and settle, get going, build houses, build villages, farms, everything. Get moving on settlement, okay? But then you have the children of Joseph, so both from Ephraim and from Manasseh, they came to Joshua and they have a complaint. They're saying, you gave us a land that is not good, okay? He says, first of all, um, we don't have enough area to, to graze. We don't have enough area to farm. We don't have enough good area. Because what is he saying now? He says, it's all mountains. It's all mountains. What are we supposed to do with the mountains? And also we have here that in the valleys, in this area, there's some valleys in between. Those areas are still occupied by the Canaanites. And it gives you very interesting here in verse um, 16, it says um, uh, that the Canaanites have the um, iron chariots, okay? And this is, this is a very interesting point. Um, in capturing the land, this tells us a lot about what, what happened and how they captured the land, okay? The nation of Israel comes into the land now. You can imagine they're kind of a ragtag bunch. They, they won wars, that's great. But remember the description of the wars, especially at the beginning, lots of miracles that helped them along, okay? But they are primarily an infantry, an infantry force and they're even not even as much of an infantry force. They're also probably a lot of a commando kind of force. OK, they take advantage of being swift and and laying, um, uh, you know, plan strategic plans. You remember how they captured the A.I. the first the second time when it was successful. They had a plan and they kind of ambushed the city from two different sides. So these are the tactics of an army that is does not have technology and does not have the numbers. And that works in certain situations. So here they're dealing with a situation where the Canaanites have chariots, okay? They have these much more sophisticated fighting machines, the tanks of today, you would say. And what do they have? They don't have it. So it was much easier for the Israelites to capture the mountains because the mountains, the chariots are no good on mountains. Chariots can't go up and down mountains. Whereas a, a swift fighting force that fights on its feet can much more easily scamper up and down the mountains and take over the mountains. So you have a situation here where even though that entire area is in the hands of the children of Joseph, the areas that are broader valleys, the Canaanites are still there. And so the area that is more easily left to these people, to the Ephraimites and the Menashites or whatever you want to call them, okay, is a mountainous area. And they come to Joseph, what are we supposed to do? Not only is it mountains, it's full of forest. So what is Joshua say to them in, in, in verse 18, he says, you're right, you have the mountains and it's full of forests. He says, but cut down the forests, cut down the trees, and then you will be able to use the, the hills to plant. Now, I was with a tour guide uh, not that long ago. Um, we were doing a film and we have this actually on our film, I believe, our virtual tour in Carnation Rome. Danny Erla, who is really one of our favorite tour guides, gives this explanation. He points to the terraces that you can see right there from Carnation Rome. So you're looking at the terraces that are on the borders between Ephraim and Menashe. It's this exact area. And you can see terraces that are really very ancient. And he put forth the idea that it is perhaps that is what they did here. They cut down the trees and they created the terraces, terraces so they could indeed plant and farm on the hills because it was harder for them to deal with the valleys. Okay, in uh, ver chapter 18, we have this, this bit of criticism here. Uh, until now, we have, we have, um, we have gotten rid of uh, three more tribes. We had two and a half tribes that were settled in Moses' time east of the Jordan. And these chapters that we just went through now are the borders of Judah, Ephraim, and Manasseh. There's still seven tribes that have not gotten their, their, uh, their uh, um, territory. And Joshua kind of loses patience with them. He says, what are you hanging around here? They're sitting around in Shiloh waiting for miracles to happen. And he's basically saying, go out and scout the land and bring back, bring back. He's saying that draw a map, go out, scout the land, draw maps, bring them back. And then they do another, uh, another lot. Okay. And you see that in verse eight, 
these people, they went out as Joshua commanded them. They went to write the land. In other words, to map it out. Okay. And then he, they come back. And again, they do this, this lot. But here in verse eight, what does it says? I will, uh, I will strike down or I would throw in a lot before God in Shiloh. So here it makes it very clear. We're in the place of the tabernacle. We're in Shiloh. And so this whole lot, deal of a lot is not just some coincidence, but it's actually uh, planned uh, and it's actually by God. One more thing I just want to point out. Oh, I have a couple more things. Quick, quick, quick. I'm going to do the rest real quick. Okay. So verse 19, the, the first verse, excuse me, chapter 19, the first verse, um, we see that Simeon, Simeon, his, their, um, their territory is within the territory of Judah. It is completely surrounded by Judah. It's in the middle of the territory of Judah. And I think I mentioned to you um, last week or maybe a couple of weeks ago when Jacob's blessing to Levi and Simeon, okay, he says he will distribute them. He will spread them out and distribute them amongst the all. And we saw how with Levite, they don't have a territory at all. Simeon will have a territory, but they're going to be subsumed within Judah. So both Levi and Simeon don't really have normal territories like everyone else, which is really in fulfillment of what Jacob said to them before he died. Uh, and at the end, uh, chapter 19, starting with verse 40, we have the story of Dan, the trap tribe of Dan. And this is something that's very interesting because if we look at their original, based upon the original lot, okay, they are in the center of the country. They are up against Judah. They're somewhere like between Judah and the Mediterranean, shall we see? So we say, so if those of you who are familiar with Beit Shemesh, the, the uh, city there that is the southwest of Jerusalem, so this is the area. And those of you who may have driven in that area, you might notice even today uh, a, a town that's called Eshtaol. Well, Eshtaol is mentioned right here. Um, these areas, and then you, you see also the word Ekron mentioned, which is further west, and that becomes the Philistine city later on. And um, we learn about Yehud, which is a, today a name of a town near Tel Aviv, B'nai Brak, which is an Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox city also near Tel Aviv. And we, we may have the mention of the Yarkon River, which is a river that flows through the middle of Tel Aviv. Uh, and it mentions Jaffa. So the original tribe, tribal territory of Dan goes from Beit Shemesh to Tel Aviv, roughly. Okay, for those of you who are familiar with the, the map. But then we learn what? We learned that, and this is in verse 47, we learned that the Dan tribe went up to fight with Leshem. Now, the, this is something that happens later. We learn about this in the book of Judges, but it's telling us here. Why? Because here we have the territory of Dan, but they never end up being there. They're there for a short time. Just to give you a hint, okay? For those of you who study Judges and want to go read Judges, Samson is from the tribe of Dan, and Samson is in the area of Eshtaol and Beit Shemesh, okay? And yet, at the end of the book of Judges, we have the story of the idol of Micah and the temple of Micah. And in that story, and that is, and I can give you the exact uh, reference to that. Uh, I did write it down. Yes, that is in Judges um, 18. Judges 18, we have the story of the conquest by the tribe of Dan going north to Laish. Now here it's called Leshem, but they assume that this is the same as Laish. When you come to Israel and you go to Tel Dan, and you see the, the sources of the Jordan River and that lovely spring there. And some of you, you know, you go up to the part where they have the excavations and there's a gate that they say from the time of Abraham. Uh, and also what they found in that very same area is a, an, a, a stone with an inscription on that talks about the house of David, which, by the way, is one of the proofs that is brought today that there was a house of David. You know, their archeology span say, oh, it's all a myth. There was never a house of David. Um, but no, this, this is one of those proofs. So that's the city. It's the city of Dan that initially Dan was supposed to be where Tel Aviv is today. They found it too full of nations. We see later on the Philistines are there, the Canaanites are there. We're gonna learn more about that when we hit the book of Judges. But this kind of just tells us what happens uh, later on. And finally, if we come to the towards the end here, the end of this chapter, and verse 49, we learned this is it. They finished. This was the end. They had captured everything except for these pockets that they didn't capture, but more or less they captured the land. And these are the borders. They had. They each got what they were supposed to get. Okay. And then 
we see what happens to Joshua at the very end. After everybody gets their piece, Joshua, who was from the tribe of Ephraim, gets his own town. Okay, he gets a town called Timnat Serach, which is the mountain of Ephraim, and he built that city and settled there. Now, later on in the book of Judges, in chapter 19, we have this story repeated, except there, instead of being called Timnat Serach, it's called Timnat Cheres. The, the first, they, they switch the words. And so, Serach Cheres, okay? And today, there is an Arab village um, just outside, just northwest of Ariel called Kifl Cheres. And it's thought that Kifl Cheres and Timnat Cheres are the same, okay? And, and this is where it is believed that Joshua is buried. Uh, and they have a, 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 a tomb there, a sign of a tomb, that there is a tradition that that is Joshua's tomb right now in an Arab village very close to Ariel. Anyway, that brings us to the end of, 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 um, of chapter 19. They finished the job. Uh, they're there standing in Shiloh. Everybody got their territory. And... Uh, it's certainly an end of an era in a way, but that doesn't mean everything is great. We have this sense of peace. We have a sense of, of, of everything is good. Uh, but as we will see starting next week, there's still more work to be done. And here and there come some issues as well. So that's all for today. I'm sorry I went over time a bit, but I wanted to just finish this, this, uh, this section. Anyone have questions or comments? Uh, I want to say and... something. Can you yeah. hear me? Yes, Can you yes. hear? Uh, okay, when you were talking about the Baal, uh, it's very interesting that now Baal is husband. Right. So and there, I must say, though, Baal means master. Okay. Now, yeah. for some reason, that became husband. And in traditional times, your husband was your master. Today, there are many feminists who say they don't like the word Baal, even though it's just become the regular word. Nobody thinks about what Baal means. Like a boss. Go. Yeah, like that he's the boss. <laughs> right, right. So, no, but most people, it's such a part of our normal modern Hebrew vocabulary. You don't think of what it means. But today, there are many women who are saying, my husband is not my master. And so instead of calling Ooh. him Baal, they're calling him Ish, my man. Okay. <laughs> Which is really the biblical terms. Okay. Right. When God talks about Adam and Eve, he talks to them by man and woman. He doesn't say husband and wife. He doesn't say Baal. The word there is man and woman. So you have uh, today many, many women going back to that original biblical term and saying, my man, Ishi, as opposed to Baali, my husband. And on the other hand, it's written there in Bereshit that it's not good for him to be alone. Lot over your right. Adam Levado, he needs the woman. <laughs> right, he needs the woman. Remember that, you men, you need the women. You need the women. Now, I, one thing that's great in these classes, I must say, the women always have the upper hand. Just look at our numbers. So guys, <laughs> you know, don't argue with us right now. It's not worth it. <laughs> Yes, Judy. Judy, what did you have to say? Um, I was just a question. You know how you said that Dan moved from between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, sort of to Tel the Aviv coast there. Yeah, yeah, Bat Shemesh to um, Tel Aviv, and then they moved up north. Did they kick anybody else out of that area? Was another tribe given that area before? That's a very good question. It is really up in the north. Mm -hmm. And um, you would think it would be closer to like Reuben and God up there. Um, but there's no mention of that. What there okay. is, though, is there are Canaanites living there. It is a Canaanite city. And in the description of what happens in Judges, they massacre the city. They go in and say, you know what? There's people here, but they don't. It, it's very interesting. It's a very cynical take on the whole thing because they say the nearest city is Sidon. Sidon, mm -hmm. of course, is in Lebanon. So and Sidon is so far away that they will not be able to come to the aid of the people of Laish. So they just take it over, capture it, and then it becomes theirs. So it's interesting because I guess having to, to conquer the area between Beit Shemesh and Tel Aviv is full of Canaanites and Philistines. And that they see that as being so much more complicated. Whereas when they mm. go up north, there's this little city all by itself and surrounding areas empty. And then they just get rid of this one city and they suddenly have themselves a territory. So, so that's what happened. Is it because good there's, an al there's an altar up by down, isn't it, Ms. Bear? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, again, definitely. in the story of the Micah, okay, that we read in Judges chapter 
I wrote this. Said, I checked it it. This is a story. It's a problematic story because it's a story about this Micah who builds an, a temple, a, mm. a pagan temple. And he's an Ephraim. Okay. And then these guys from Don take him upstairs. Well, they don't take him. They steal his idol. Mm. They steal his <laughs> idol and they go up to the north. So the idea being they make this temple in the north. Uh, and that temple, it says at the end of the story, that temple is uh, lasts the entire time that the tabernacle in Shiloh lasts. That's mm. almost 400 years. It was so, the house of David in the north. The, they were oh, given... that's much later. That's much later. Uh, and as much later, Dan becomes like a city, like a boss at the time of David. They're not worshiping idols. Right. In the time of David. They were so, given permission, weren't they? Because they were so far north, they couldn't make the pilgrimages. And so they were sort of allowed no, to have their no, own. They weren't allowed. They didn't. They weren't allowed. Yeah. That was even later. Okay. So yeah. David, um, the, this, it doesn't say that this belonged to the house of David. It talks about they're part of the house of David. In other words, during David's time, the entire Israel from mm -hmm. north to south is under David. And mm -hmm. that remains under Solomon as well. After Solomon's death, the kingdom splits into two. Mm -hmm. And Dan goes under the, the northern kingdom, which is much larger. And Jeroboam is the first king there. When Jeroboam comes to power, one of the first things he does, he wants to make sure that he's not, uh, he, he feels com he's competing in a way with the house of David that's ruling in Judea. But he wants to kind of solidify his hold not just politically, but religiously. So he puts two golden calves, okay? Builds two temples, one in Dan and one in Beit El. Mm. Uh, Beit El is just north of Jerusalem. And then he says to the people, and it's a sin that he does this, but he mm. says to the people, you don't have to go to Jerusalem. You can, the northern people can go to Dan, the further south people can go to Beit El. <laughs> Your religious, uh, sacrificial, whatever needs are being meant here no need to go to Jerusalem. And that, of course, was a huge sin. But that is something that it was done. Yeah, that's what I meant. Not necessarily allowed by God, but that was a yeah. permission that they had. Right, right, right. Thank you for clearing that up. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, wait, someone else had something to say? No. Bye, Richard. Okay, well, great to see all of you. And we'll see you again you. next week. Thanks a lot. See you. Bye bye. 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 I hope you enjoyed that video. And we'd like to be sure you're getting all of our video content. So just click on the subscribe button below as well as on the notification bell. And that way you will have easy access to all our material. We look forward to staying in touch with you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.